wherever you are in this world to this last session of the Fourth World University Summit being hosted by the International Institute for Higher Education Research and Capacity Building at OP Jindal Global University. We have had 25 panel sessions since the summit was inaugurated yesterday morning. And I can't imagine we are at the last 25th panel session now. And with a very, very exciting set of panelists. And the topic of this panel is creating inclusive learning environment, promoting diversity and global citizenship. Globalization is, of course, not new, even though the recent pace at which globalization is taking place uh, is extremely fast compared to how it happened in previous centuries. With this rapid rise and increase in the mobility of people around the world, cultural diversity has become the norm in the 21st century. Universities have historically attracted diverse bodies of students from many parts of the world. However, research evidence from both the global north and south is telling us that creating inclusive learning environments is a major challenge for all universities in contemporary times. Most research intensive universities are seeking to establish inclusive learning environments in the concept of a global village to nurture future global citizens. What are the challenges in promoting diversity and global citizenship on campus? What kind of university administrative policies and practices are required to successfully create inclusive learning environments for all students from diverse backgrounds? This panel is going to deliberate on these pressing issues. I am Professor Dr. Moshumi Mukherjee, Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the International Institute for Higher Education Research and Capacity Building here at Gopi Jindal Global University. And I have been engaged over the past eight years since I joined this university, uh, promoting some of these efforts. Uh, I also teach a course on global citizenship and international understanding at this university. I'm going to now introduce to all of you our esteemed panelists from around the world uh, who have joined with me. Uh, professor uh, Dr. Elena de Prada. She's also an associate professor in English for Special Purposes at the University of Vigo in Spain. During the last eight years, she has been the Vice Dean of International Affairs at the Business and Tourism Faculty. She coordinates European double degree programs in management studies and tourism and organizes international joint seminars and international weeks for students and professors at our university. Her publications and research guidelines are focused on foreign language learning, uh, English effect language learning, teacher, teacher tra training, innovative teaching, learning methods, continuing education, multilingualism, interculturality and creativity. She works to develop higher education teachers' ability to raise awareness about diversity and inclusion in their teaching practices, but also their ability to teach effectively in a diverse environment. And she's enhancing the capacity of higher education institutions at large to develop and implement courses on global citizenship and diversity management. Welcome to you, Dr. Deep Prada. I have with me also Professor Dr. Mona Hori, uh, and she's a full professor and vice president for strategy and diversity. Professor Corey is a, a previous dean of the Paul Berald School of Social Work and Social Welfare at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She's an alumna of the Israel Young Academy and the Global Young Academy. She holds the Francis and George Cards Family Chair at the Paul Berald School of Social Work and Social Welfare at the Hebrew University. In 2021, Professor Khoury won the Bruno Memorial Prize for Outstanding Israeli Researchers. 
She was a 2002 Fulbright postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago and a visiting professor at the Factor in Wish Faculty of Social Work, University of Toronto for two non-subsequent academic years. In 2023, Professor Hori received the President of Israel's Medal of Honor in recognition of her extraordinary contribution to the State of Israel. Her research focuses on child and adolescents' deviant and delinquent behaviors in three particular areas, school violence, um, cyberbullying, and juvenile delinquency and political violence. Her research examines how socio-political context influences child and adolescent development and adjustment. Our third panelist today is Professor Dr. Nirmala Rao. She is currently the Vice Chancellor of Kriya University, Andhra Pradesh. She formerly served as the Vice Chancellor of the Asia University for Women between 2017 and 2022. Pro-director of the School of Oriental and African Studies during 2008 and 2017, and pro-warden for academic affairs at Goldsmiths College, University of London. Dr. Rao took her first degree in economics from Delhi University and thereafter her master's from JNU and PhD from the University of London. She has published extensively in the field of urban policy and politics, um, and uh, her work, her, um, extensive, uh, she has extensive experience of public service in the UK and served as an advisor to a range of bodies, including Audit Commission and Office of Deputy Prime Minister. For several years, she has a lay, she, she was a lay member of the General Council of the Bar of England and Wales and a non-executive director of NHS Hospital Trust. Uh, she was elected fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in 2003 and was awarded the Order of British Empire for services to scholarship in 2011. Welcome to you, Dr. Rao, to this panel. Our, Next panelist is Professor Elizabeth Simmons. Uh, she is Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University of California, San Diego. She is the institution's second ranking executive and serves as Chief Academic Officer overseeing academic programs and policies, as well as academic personal services across uh, the campus. Simmons is passionate about advancing the goals of University of San Diego's strategic plan, which emphasizes excellence in education, research, and public service with a commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Simmons is also a theoretical high-energy physicist and distinguished professor of physics at the UC San Diego. She is currently studying how physics beyond the standard model might manifest in experiments in progress at the CERN Large Hardin Collider. Prior to joining University of California, San Diego, Simmons served as associate provost for faculty and academic staff development at, uh, and dean of Lehman Briggs College and University Distinguished Professor of Physics at Michigan State University. Welcome to all the distinguished panelists and, and uh, I'm really, really excited and looking forward to hear from all of you about your diverse experiences uh, in your diverse context in promoting uh, inclusivity, in promoting diversity and learning and global citizenship. Uh, what are the key challenges? My first question uh, to, to the entire panelist, you know, if you could share a little bit of reflection, each one of you, um, beginning with uh, Professor Deep Prada, what are the key challenges in promoting the concept of global citizenship according to you uh, with regards to your work at your university? You have to unmute. You have to unmute yourself, Professor Di Prada. Hello, is that okay? okay. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Thank you very much for this invitation and for being here together. It's a great pleasure and honor. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to answer the, the question about the challenges that we have to face. Maybe we should very briefly state the 
the great differences that uh, Spain is experiencing regarding mobility in the last years, not only student mobility, but mobility in general. Um, for many years, Spain was, um, was a country uh, that sent many people, many workers, many uh, cities abroad in search for better conditions, for a better economic situation, education, etc. So um, the situation in, in, in several decades have been quite the opposite. From being, the, from being senders, we are becoming receivers. So it's been a, a great change in the composition and direction of uh, migratory uh, flows. Um, and at the moment, for example, in this first decade of this century, Spain was the country in Europe that experienced the highest growth in the foreign uh, populations of the entire Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development countries. So, of course, all the changes, all the challenges that we have to face at the university are, are highly determined by what is happening in general in our societies, because the changes are occurring, not only in terms of the balance of flows, but also at the level of the countries involved, because depending on, on the years, and there are differences in the, in, the, in the countries, in the different cultures that come to, to establish in, in this um, country. So um, at the moment, at the moment, uh, we have a positive migratory balance, meaning that we uh, get more um, people than the one we, we send. And uh, this is the context for, in general, for the um, circulation of people. But in the context of, um, of education, we are also in a very um, relevant position regarding mobility for credits. It's important to distinguish that contrary to what happens in other parts of the world, in Europe, I, I saw that there are some of the participants from, from the European context, most of the mobility is for credits. I mean, it's not that the students go there to study the whole, their whole degree, but on the contrary, they come for a short period of time, for a term or for a year. So um, we also have to cope with this situation because it's a, a very unstable sort of speak movement and flow of, um, of students. So, so um, at the moment, uh, as with, with the population, we are at the top, we are the top country in, in terms of mobility of attracting and sending uh, students because there are some other countries who send a lot of students but don't receive and the opposite. But it, it, for example, Spain is one of the countries in Europe in which movement is a, a main characteristic in, in higher education because we receive a lot of students and we send a lot of students. So that's why the challenge is is several fold it <laughs> because on the one hand we have all these um, students that come here to study not just as international students because they are they are going to be established here to study here a, a degree because they are going to be permanently or at least for a, a long time are going to be in Spain and on the other hand we have these other students that come here just for a short period of time so universities at the moment are challenging a lot of uh, different situations and um, we have to study many ways about how to integrate these different types of uh, international students so we really have quite a lot of work ahead so i am very interested to, to 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 listen to what other people that have been more involved in in this type of uh, mobility international mobility experiences uh, can uh, can give us thank today you. thank you very much thank you thank you so much uh, professor d prada i would now go to professor mona Khuri. professor Khuri, if you could share some light on this, yes. uh, from your uh, perspective from Israel, some of the challenges? Yeah, so maybe I'll say shortly a few words about the um, situation in Israel, as you know, about the population, not the situation. The situation is more complicated to explain now, but the population in Israel is actually comprised of one a very large minority group, which is the um, Arabs in Israel. And it, it's around 20%, 21% of the Israeli population. And then we have new immigrants from Ethiopia, from Russia. And also we have another a 
a diversity, diverse groups such as first generation to education, people with disabilities, and the LGBTQ plus community. So, and we have another group, which is the ultra Orthodox Jews. This is a group that has a special a, a characteristics because they actually don't study during school years a core subject. They don't study English, they don't study math, they don't study science. They study only religious uh, topics. So when they come to the university, actually they start from zero with all the core subjects. And usually they study in a separate education system by gender. So males study alone and females study alone. So when they come to the university, it's actually their first time that they are studying in a mixed institution. So we, as you can see, we have different challenges for each group, but one of the main challenges that all the diverse groups face is financial uh, issues. They all mostly come from first generation to education from families who are from low socioeconomic status. And many of them suffer from a uh, financial difficulties. So we have a lot of scholarships for uh, uh, these groups, but Another a challenge that we know that they have is the language issue, especially English for most of them and Hebrew for Arab students. Arab students study during their school years in Arabic. So the first time they start studying in Hebrew is actually at the university. People like me uh, that I'm also Arab, we study Hebrew at the university at the school, but not as, you know, it's as a, a second or third language. And for the first time that we became studying and hearing things in, in the whole day in Hebrew is during uh, the university. And of course, the Hebrew university is situated in Jerusalem. So we have a lot of uh, political issues. And sometimes, unfortunately, as these days that we have a war in Israel and there are also some tension, maybe later I will refer to that. But in general, these are the main issues that these uh, groups face. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Khori. Let me now uh, call upon <laughs> Professor Rao uh, from India, from Kriya University. Um, thank you, Moshmi. If um, I may say, I'm just putting a comparison between the 35 years of experience I've had in the UK with um, the last seven years in Asia, and particularly in India, it's only been about 18 months. I'll give a very quick um uh, reflections on how I see the concept as it has evolved. I mean, between the 1980s and 2017, in the UK, for example, the idea of global citizenship diversity um, started off from the concept of widening participation, um, <clears throat> extending access to those who would not, you know, otherwise have the option to um, access higher education. Uh, to the development of international partnerships, placements, exchanges, enhancing student mobility, to the time I left in 2017, uh, which was to do with decolonizing the curricula. So the focus was on how do we revisit the curriculum? How do we reflect upon uh, its delivery, its content, and uh, bring back authors and knowledge that are pushed to the margins and get citizens, uh, students to be more global in their uh, exposure and thinking. So that's been the kind of movement in, in, in the UK. And when I went for five years leading this university in um, Bangladesh, which is the Asian University for Women, specially set up to attract young women from very underserved communities. Now, a couple of points that Mona touched on the difficulties of language or difficulties of um, uh, uh, barriers to not knowing language is a big problem because um, when I joined, there were students from about only three countries, including India, Nepal, Bangladesh. And by the time I left in 22, we had students from young women from 19 different countries with the second largest cohort from Afghanistan and the third from the Rohingya communities. So uh, it extended to Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Yemen, and uh, whole of Southeast Asia, including Timor Leste and so on. Now, the language was a big issue because they're all um, studied in their own languages. English was not a medium of common medium of communication. We had to put special programs, the two year pre access and access program, to get them up to speed and then start the degree program, which was a liberal arts 
curriculum um, modeled on the Chicago style. So it is a real challenge. Uh, we had to really be very selective. And the challenge was how do we select and recruit students with the promise and the potential who did not have the language. And um, so that, you know, I can speak endlessly about it. But um, so that was a huge challenge. But um, five years, you know, after they've been in the university, they were equipped with all the skills, the tools, and um, placed in um, UN Women, World Bank, uh, Deloitte's in Tokyo. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing journey of five years of residential learning. Um, that was one experience. And of course, there were issues of diversity and how to make them global as well, in terms of enabling them to make real world connections between the local knowledge and, and what was happening, the global. And whilst at the same time, creating an inclusive environment that would foster multiple perspectives and defining the curriculum for them, um, which was difficult, but challenging, but quite rewarding and successful. In Korea, it's been a totally different other end of the spectrum. Um, in AUW, all the women were um, on scholarships, 100%. Um, you come to Korea, about 80% are on uh, fee paying. And um, uh, in terms of um, um, affluence, um, well of students who progress to the top elite universities. However, there are still 30% from the marginalized or the underserved communities. And uh, But the diversity issue is a different one here. And where in AUW, we had 19 countries represented. How do we bring them collectively? Uh, here it is, um, the idea of liberal arts, as you know, Moshmi, in India is still gaining currency. It's not yet there. And the four largest groupings come from um, Maharashtra and uh, Karnataka and Calcutta and of course um, Tem Delhi and then Tamil Nadu or Andhra Pradesh where it's located it's still not caught up so one of the challenges is um, it's not the curriculum because we are redefining the curriculum we call it interwoven uh, curriculum and I can talk about it later which is about making um, crossing beyond one's disciplines and making connections not just in disciplines, but also through um, other ecosystems. And um, and how do we do that to create that kind of civic engagement or foster civic engagement among among students? And um, it's, it has its own challenges, but a different kind of uh, diversity where you have these regional identities and a bit of parochialism in terms of students sticking with their own Clan, quite clannish, I would right, say. Right, I can imagine that uh, from our own campus here at Obijinda, um in Sonipat. Um, so uh, I would now like to move to Professor Elizabeth Simmons from the US, uh, uh, sharing us her perspective from the United States of America, which has attracted international students and immigrants from around the world for many, many years, and especially places like California. Over to you, Professor Simmons. Thanks very much. I, I'm going to pick up on that, that theme of um, clannishness that Professor Rao was just mentioning. Um, I think we all know that this is this is a particularly challenging time when we have widespread economic tensions, we have armed conflict in different parts of the world that are straining relationships, even among traditional allies, and everything is very confusing. And at the same time, we have looming climate change at a catastrophic level, which tells us we really do have to be working together, even if we are feeling some discomfort at trying to work together. And um, so at this moment, I think some of the challenge in promoting the idea of global citizenship to our students is to help the students see beyond their own experiences and beyond the biases that they may have or news about different conflicts that they may read about in, in the media and, and social media. And um, the um, so some of that's, you know, th that's an aspect for the students. Now the faculty and staff have to actually try to uh, make 
global citizenship part of the curriculum and part of the co-curriculum. And so we need to, we have a challenge of trying to appropriately publicize and reward global engagement and the work that that takes for the faculty and staff. And to, um, I guess, a related challenge is making the rules, making the processes understandable. So faculty know where they are allowed to travel to and under what conditions. I have to confess that the US government has made it quite hard to understand where faculty are allowed to travel and whether they can bring their computer, very simple things like this. Um, and uh, I'm sure it's even more confusing for the students trying to understand all, all the issues about, about uh, visas, uh, credit portability and so on. But we do, as you pointed out, have huge opportunities right here at UC San Diego. 10% of our undergraduates are from abroad um, and uh, from uh, a whole, from dozens of, of different countries. And we're very proud of that. We also are right on the international border with Mexico, which gives a lot of opportunities. So when we encounter um, a challenge such as uh, you know, students not being sure if they want to engage internationally. Well, there are students from around the world right there in the classroom, and we can design courses to bring that out. We can design learning communities and other opportunities that will bring them, bring them into contact with students from elsewhere and remind them that we are, we are all people. We may come from different places, we may have different cultures, but we are all people and we should be able to work together and, and learn from each other. And when we have students, and of course, being a public university, we have uh, a huge fraction of our students come from either uh, underserved backgrounds where uh, the school system wasn't that great or didn't prepare them that well, uh, where perhaps uh, they're from an immigrant family and English is not their first or maybe even second language, as others have mentioned. And uh, we have uh, at least a third of our students who are um, both first generation in college and um, uh, uh, from uh, financial circumstances that make it very difficult to afford to go to university. And even for these students, because because we're on the border, we should be able to provide accessible and low cost ways to engage internationally. So there are all these challenges, all the challenges that everybody else has mentioned, we, we experience as well. We try to also look at the opportunities we have from the international students with us and the proximity of the border. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh... Uh, Professor Simmons, and I really appreciate the fact that while talking about challenges, you even you ended uh, with opportunities, reference to uh, looking at diversity, not just as a challenge, but also an opportunity. Okay. Um, oftentimes, diversity, even though diversity is the law of nature, right? But we we are not trained, our minds are not trained to look at diversity as an opportunity. Often it is seen as a challenge, like some kind of additional administrative burden and something, you know, various stakeholders uh, at the university, educational institution, different institutions, uh, they have to, they look at, oh, diversity is another issue that we have to deal with. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, my, my my next question to all of you as panelists um, uh, is um, what, according to you, how we can look at the issue of diversity as an opportunity rather than a challenge? And uh, can we look at diversity as an opportunity to actually engage the students and the campus community with diversity in a more constructive uh, way so that they can come out of their uh, natural inclinations of being 
within a particular clan. I know there has been several studies of peer groups uh, in the United States and in other countries, how students from peer groups, and they generally tend to uh, form peer groups who come from similar background. Uh, for whatever reasons uh, around the world, uh, uh, you know, we all have this kind of, uh, uh, as we get socialized, uh, within our families, within our linguistic groups, within our religious institutions, within our little communities. Uh, this is how we form our sense of identity, who we are, and we tend to attract uh, towards, in, uh, go towards those who come from similar backgrounds. So my, my question to all of you, and you can take the uh, uh, time to respond one by one, uh, is how can we look at diversity as an opportunity uh, rather than a challenge? Who will go first? So maybe maybe I will go first. Actually, yes, yes, after what yes. I mentioned, uh, this is Mona from Israel, from the Hebrew University. And after what I mentioned earlier about the, the education system in Israel, it's actually, maybe to emphasize, it's separate by ethno-national and religiousity. So Arab students learn in Arab schools and Jewish students in Jewish schools. And within the Jewish system, Jewish students, very religious Jewish students, learn in a separate one and religious in different one and secular Jews in third one. So... The first time all these groups meet each other is at the university. So we try to use this opportunity actually to do two main things, to bring these groups to the university. So our main goal as a, as a diversity unit is to increase access for higher education for these groups, because if we want them to meet, we have to have them at the university. So, for example, during the ten, last 10 years, the number of Arab students at the university increased from 10% to 21%. So we did a lot of efforts to bring more and more students to the Hebrew University. The second thing is having programs that enable these students to meet with each other and speak with each other. So one of the things, for example, we have a large project called the Inclusive Class in which we have students that they are doing assignments in mixed mm -hmm. groups. And the professors of these groups are going into training how to do this in a, in a good way that you will not humiliate some of the students by forcing them doing the assignment with someone that they don't want. So we have the whole theory of that. And now we have a research checking before and after with a comparison group to check how a, a, a effective this program. Another thing, and you can see in my logo of the unit, is that we believe that diversity is the path for excellence. And we actually try to say that every time and to show the data. And we know that we want to support students from diverse groups because if they, we help them face these challenges and cope with the challenges that we all mentioned, actually, we know that we have the common challenges, as my colleagues mentioned, they can be the best students. In some cases, they are not reaching excellency because of the difficulties they come with. For example, the language, the, economics, the social and economic situation and others. So we also try to help them academically. So we want, now we're working on opening a center for uh, academic skills that they will help them in the writing uh, and editing of their, uh, especially for research students, and also financially, because if I want the student to invest in his learning, I should support them and not sending them to work because they can't do both things with all the challenges that they have. They have more challenges than another, you know, the regular, as we can say, students. So this is like general. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Uh, yes, Professor Rao, go ahead. Um, very quickly, Ramshmi, I think um, Monet has touched on this. And uh, while diversity brings perspective, different perspectives, which are very rich and, you know, very deep, and um, I think there's space for uh, innovation when you have so many multiple. When we have diversity, not just by gender, but also religious and linguistics and um, diversity defined by different races and ethnicity and so on, 
uh, it's not really a challenge, but it's uh, it's an opportunity to um, try and bring them together, either through performing arts, cultural activities, workshops, or whatever. We we do bring them, you know, unite them. And I think perfor performing arts, particularly as a prism through which you can actually unite these different cultures, it's worked really well in both the institutions, past and present. But I do think higher education, arguably today, we have a fundamental civic mission, and that is to develop a socially critical consciousness within the students. And when you have a diverse group contribute to the development of a just and equitable society. And I think we should see that as an opportunity. And I think there's much to be said about how we are falling short, I suppose. And it's not any one particular country or region, but generally, how do we actually uh, take greater responsibility to produce um, graduates who are able to take what they learn and transform them uh, that to uses not for the individual, but for the society as a whole. And I think curriculum has a big role to play there um, in bringing this kind of diversity and creating a global citizen who's able to appreciate the global aspects and think local you know, think globally and act locally is the kind of, you know, the phrase that we all, we all are used to. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rao. I can see Professor Simmons raising her hand. Go ahead, please. Thanks very much. Um, to what has already been said, I would add that um, we engage in constant communication and discussion about this kind of topic. Uh, one thing that we keep talking about a lot is our mission as a public university in the United States and in the state of California. That means that we are supposed to serve the people of the entire state and not just people from one um, ethnic group or from one uh, socioeconomic group, but really everybody. Um, we remind people that our strength as a university comes entirely from innovation. Innovation and entrepreneurship are a big part of how we work at, at UC San Diego. And so then we can remind people of all the research that's been done showing that diverse teams are more creative, they are more innovative, they get past bottlenecks in problems that less diverse teams can, can get stuck on. So we remind them how uh, diversity contributes to this other basic part of our nature. And then we work a lot to remind people to keep a growth mindset, to say that the experiences that we had before we came to university, the skills that we, that we bring to university, those are the starting point, but they don't define what our students will be capable of, that the whole point of their coming to university is for us to help them build additional skills so they can do more than their previous background prepared them to. Otherwise, why, what would be the point? You know, what would be the point of coming to university? Um, we remind them that all the students have to pass the same admissions criteria to even be admitted. So now we need to be there for them and help them uh, move ahead. And I, I would say that our faculty um, are generally pretty passionate about this, this kind of mission of, um, of being there for all of our students, helping all of our students advance and seeing that as a way to prepare that next generation that's gonna help solve some of the problems that perhaps our generation and earlier ones didn't do such a good job of, of solving. So I would say that, that um, I'm fortunate to be at, at a place and in a state where people still take this seriously, because you know that in the United States at the moment, uh, it's a bit of an uphill climb in, in many parts of the country where there is a lot of effort to say that uh, diversity is a bad thing and that one should not work on diversity. And people at many universities in other states are um, quite frightened about that and quite concerned. And California is one of the states where this is still very basic to our identity within California and the university. So uh, cha challenges again, but uh, luckily good people to work with. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Simmons. Professor Dave Prada, 
how can we look at diversity as an opportunity? Well, my colleagues have, the other professors have mentioned many, many of the key points about this topic. Um, I would like to, to add, uh, although it was also mentioned that uh, fortunately research, empirical research, it, uh, can give us a hand here to persuade stakeholders that diversity, uh, also we can observe it in our classes when we try to, to use different uh, approaches, different techniques to, to, to make diversity um, something visible and something practical in our, in our teaching. But what research tells us is that, as, as it was mentioned before, that lots of um, very positive points come out thanks to, um, to, the, different, uh, to the difference in the, in the classroom, in the, in the university. And uh, not only regarding teamwork skills, creativity, social and communicative skills, emotional and personal growth. I mean, there are so many um, possible advantages uh, that could make that the experience of a student at the university or, or a professor as well, because nowadays we're also receiving lots of uh, professors from different countries. And so it's not only a question of, um, of the students, but other colleagues as well. For example, whenever a colleague from a different country comes to our university, it's also you know, a, 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 an eye-opening sort of situation because, because of the ways of dealing with uh, different things, of approaching topics in a different manner. So I think um, for me, it could be very easy to persuade stakeholders that I mean with numbers and with uh, um, mentioning experiences that are being done in every part of the world. And some of them have been mentioned here. It could be easy because I'm so sure that about the positive effects that diversity has in our uh, communities in higher education that I think I could, uh, you know, very easily persuade them to, to go to the next point, which is which kind uh, of support is required for being able to, to, to make this possible, to, to make this internationalization at home possible, to promote uh, going abroad, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor De Parada. Once again, you've concluded your thoughts with referring to something very, very important. And that's something I was the next thing I was thinking in my mind. Uh, some of it you all have already mentioned uh, in terms of if we look at diversity as a resource, as, as an opportunity, uh, then, uh, you know, things uh, become... Uh, a little different rather than looking at it as an additional some uh, kind of bu additional administrative bureaucratic uh, burden we can look at diversity uh, as as an opportunity for learning uh, for you know uh, from international students or diverse groups of students uh, for everybody but there's no discounting that fact that if we have a diverse group of students uh, coming from different uh, uh, socio-cultural uh, backgrounds, uh, there needs to be certain kind of support services uh, available for them. And uh, you all have already mentioned, and uh, uh, Professor Corey mentioned uh, different kinds of activities that they're organizing at the Hebrew University to bring students together. Professor Rao mentioned uh, through performing arts, how we can bring stu uh, students together and break those walls and barriers uh, to, to help them come out of their little clans uh, to make uh, friendships to make relationships outside of that familiar clan. Um, but um, I would further like to hear from each one of you with regards to your own specific institutions, what kind of uh, policies and have there been any, um, you know, conscious uh, policy decisions taken, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and how are those policies driving practices uh, in classrooms, administrative practices, practices uh, across uh, the university campus? Has there been any specific policy initiatives taken? Like in India, of course, right now with the new national education policy, we have a national level mandate 
for promoting and teaching for global citizenship, which is absolutely um, uh, something very, very new within the Indian context here. Post-independence over the past six, uh, 76 years, um, uh, the prior two national education policies very much focused on uh, national citizenship. Uh, you know, uh, educational goals to develop a sense of national, united Indian national citizenship for the first time. Uh, NEP National Education Policy 2020 is talking about uh, global citizenship. Uh, so that's a national level policy mandate now we have, and uh, different institutions are working across uh, the, you, uh, the across the country seeking to create their own institutional policies um, guided by the national education policy mandate. So I would like to hear from your context. Uh, have there been specific policies? Uh, it, it might not be at the national, but even institutional level uh, that you have been engaged in and seeking to uh, uh, implement those. Yes, Professor Simmons, go ahead. So as I think I mentioned, at the national level, we're having some challenges. The Supreme Court uh, of the United States, for example, recently said that diversity cannot be a consideration in admitting people to university. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, in the state of California, we have long had a state law of that kind. So we, we were used to this, but it means that in the national context, there are a lot of challenges. What we've been, what we've been doing at UC San Diego is to um, set up a strategic plan for equity, diversity, and inclusion alongside and as part of the university's overall strategic plan. And this, uh, Equity, diversity, and inclusion strategic plan includes what we call an accountability framework. The idea is that we set clear expectations and reward systems, and we are emphasizing um, that every single leader, every single unit of the university is expected to work on closing what we call the equity gaps, uh, meaning the, the outcome gaps between students of different demographics or different life experience who come in with different, maybe knowledge of what the university is about, different degrees of preparation. They should all graduate successfully and on time if we're doing our job. So everybody's, um, uh, the, the evaluation of faculty, of leaders, of programs is uh, partly an evaluation of how they're doing at closing these equity gaps. So we track a lot of data. We have um, uh, these considerations built into the review of every academic program. Every couple years, every single department and school comes before me and the chancellor to show us their data, explain what they've been doing and what progress they've been making. And again, it's part of that process of public accountability for outcomes. And we've also put in place some structured collaboration methods to help us focus our efforts productively. So we don't just retreat to our own corners to work with our own little populations, but we have to talk to one another and say, how can we work together to do better for everybody? So we've built this through uh, many different parts of the university as, as part of pretty much everything we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really, really uh, uh, very promising to hear what you had to say in, uh, you know, at what you're doing at the institutional level without a larger national uh, framework uh, currently. I can see Professor Rao has raised her hand. Yes, Professor Rao, Rao please go ahead. Continuing the um, points made by Professor Simmons. Um, at CREA, I mean, I'd look at it both um, in terms of structural adjustments that we are making at the institution level and the curriculum adjustments in line with the national economic policy um, that, that um, propounds a certain curriculum and way of thinking 
uh, to foster that kind of um, diversity and global engagement. On the structural side, I just want to add to what Professor Simmons has already said. Uh, we have what is called the contextualized admissions process. So, um, which actually um, uh, has equity and parity in terms of everybody taking a common entrance. But once they pass the threshold, then we apply the contextualized admissions, which is giving opportunities for those um, from certain backgrounds to actually, um, uh, for them, giving them the headroom to make up for any borderline performance in academic, um, on the academic side. So um, that enables um, people from um, poorer families or not so well-to-do families um, students to get uh, financial assistance, bursaries, and so on. So about 30% of our students come having qualified uh, actually the academic criteria, then we apply the contextualized admissions, which, which gives them access and, and um, uh, uh, access to CREA. That, that's one. The other thing we've done is we've created what is ILS, which is the Inclusive Learning Support, um, which is quite different not very different, but slightly uh, out of the ordinary in, that, in the sense that we've brought all the services, whether it's mental health or disability, physical disability, um, academic support, because we see them as very interconnected. So ILS actually provides support across the board for um, all these different groups, whether it's gender or LGBTQA and, and so on, so all the groups. It's a consolidated ILS, and that seems to be working because you can see how one um, kind of disadvantage can impact on academic performance or uh, other way around. So that is the structural broadly, um, apart from, uh, and, and the other points have been covered by Professor Simon, so I won't rehearse them. But on the curriculum side, uh, taking NEP policy and uh, how does CREA actually fit in with that is our liberal arts curriculum which um, um, enhances the student's intellectual skills as a reflective practitioner, um, uh, capable of independent judgment and informed decision-making and in all aspects of the academic, professional, social and civic um, lines. So uh, there's a lot of engagement with local communities and um, uh, you know, uh, outside the curriculum that facilitate um, global citizenship uh, values. Of course, this interdisciplinarity and crossing uh, the discipline boundaries, what we call the porous boundaries, enables them to actually bring uh, multiple perspectives um, of uh, a phenomenon that they are studying. So bringing diverse groups into one kind of melting pot. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rao. Uh, Professor Deep Prada, she has already raised her hands. I can see, go ahead, please. Professor Debrada, you have to unmute. Okay, thank you, thank you. No, it was just because I, I thought it was go, going to be a good connection, what um, Professor mentioned before, um, because um, most, almost everything that it is done in at my university is outside the curriculum. I mean, there is, a, um, although there is a great interest in uh, and there are services that have been opened to, to deal with international students. And there are, there is a, a services, a new service that deals with uh, integration and diversity. They are, um, let's say, disconnected from the teaching uh, practice. They give support to students that need um, information that they need guidance, etc. But they um, diversity management is not really integrated into our daily common uh, teaching practice. Not only because of the um, of the students themselves, but the teachers themselves. We would need first some train the trainers as so, a sort of. Um, of programs to be able to integrate it into the curriculum. And of course, here is also complicated. I suppose in, in the other countries is the same problem. It's also complicated to change the, the syllabi. It, it's not, you cannot do it and suddenly integrate 
a new subject or a new competence into the curriculum that was not there before. It takes a long process. So um, um, the, the need is there. The, um, I mean, the perception of the, of the need as well is there. And things are being done, but they are being done uh, like bits, you know, around the uh, surrounding the, the actual classroom, uh, etc., with courses, with blended intensive programs, with uh, um, joint seminars, etc. Lots of activities that can make up for this necessity that we are sure that we that we lack. I mean, we are very aware, most of the, of the professors at the university, we are aware that we need this very much because we are also conscious that it is very positive for ourselves and for our students. So um, the need is there, but still uh, we need time uh, to be able to implement it properly into the curriculum because I think that would be the most effective way to be able to be dealing with, um, with some of the topics about diversity management and to, to get the full potential that diversity can give us in our in higher education. Um, Thank you. One quick question, uh, Professor Deep Prada. Has there been any government level policy mandate um, uh, across Spain or even in Galicia? No. Okay. Mm, yeah, no, so really. this is it's actually really. what I was going to say about it yes, to my colleague. In addition to all the things that we have as a univer at the university level, one of the main things that actually led the change of the way that universities all over Israel look at diverse groups is the fund that comes from the government. We have a five-year program that fund diverse groups such as the Ethiopian immigrants, uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews, Arab students. And this large amount of the funds come from the government and they have uh, actually a policy that we should follow in order to get the funds. We have to increase in, in bringing more and more students to our institutions and Another thing actually uh, that we have in that uh, respect that the policy changed the, the way universities also deal with these groups. For example, first generation to education is not part of this program, but from our obligation to help and support all the groups, we said, okay, all these groups have their own support or some support from the government, but we can't leave those outside. So we have as a university to help them from another fund, such as, you know, philanthropy. So we try to increase also. So at the government level actually affected the university level. And we believe that now when we are starting to invest in first generation, we see that the government now are looking at that. You know, the, when I say the government is the council for higher education, that the money comes from the government, looks at the first generation group and they say, OK, there is something here that we are not helping in and we should maybe suggest a plan for this group. So it's a mutual effect that we see. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Khoury. And uh, we have about uh, three minutes. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't even imagine how one hour passed by discussing and conversing with all of you. But uh, there's a very interesting audience question I have received, which actually connects with Prof what Professor Khoury just mentioned. And uh, it's kind of provo provocative. The audience is saying that Often a lot of diversity drive from universities um, around the world uh, seeks to attract students who are actually, even though they might be diverse, quote unquote, in terms of their um, uh, ethnicity, race or nationality or, or gender or whatever, but they, they generally come from more well-off background. Uh, so what about diversity increasing, thinking about increasing diversity in higher educational context uh, with regards to, you know, students who are like first generation learners coming from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. We don't think about diversity from that perspective. 
uh, with regards to attractive attracting those who are coming from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds uh, socioeconomically uh, into the higher education context. So what can be done uh, to further uh, think, think about diversity also through this lens? Uh, so can each one of you one minute quickly address this audience question? Sure, I'll just say um, that is an emphasis at the University of California. There's a lot of need-based scholarships. We have a special set of support resources for students who are first generation and Faculty and staff who themselves were first generation are very public about that. And we periodically have campaigns with buttons and t-shirts so students know who else around campus are first gen. So we do a lot of work in that important area. Excellent. Professor Huri, Professor Di Prada, Professor Rao, Professor yeah, Di Prada. Actually Actually, the, with respect to first generation, it was something, it was amazing to look at this group because we got a lot of support for different groups. But then we noticed that we have support for Arab, Jewish, ultra-Orthodox. And, and then if you, we noticed that if you are, um, I say, regular Jewish student who doesn't belong, you are not immigrant and you are not ultra-religious, you have no support. And if you are first generation, you don't fit any category. And then we noticed that actually you have almost 20 to 25% for those who actually reported that they are first generation. We believe we have much higher than that, that they don't get any support. And this is actually a very important group that we should help them because we know how important is the role models and how important if you have family that can support you, give you an advice. You know, it's not always only economic situation. It's also academic. It's very important that we know that from the other groups that they are mostly first generation, but this group is also have, it has its own needs and we didn't pay attention for them until the last two or three years. Then we noticed that we have a critical group here that we should invest in. So we are now have a lot of programs actually and scholarships for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Di Prada and then Professor Rao. Yes, just very briefly, I think one of the key aspects is also to, to give information, to, to spread the word to about the different possibilities that can be in, in the different countries. For, because, for example, uh, here in Europe, the European Commission offers sometimes strategic partnerships with different countries and that, 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 that are not European countries precisely to, to, to try to uh, attract students from all over the world. So it is very important that all the countries know, uh, both uh, teachers, students as, and stakeholders, know about this opportunities and have a powerful structure so all the students in the world that might need some kind of financial help to study abroad uh, could get it. So the key, I, I think one of the challenges as well as part, uh, in addition to what we mentioned is to spread the word about the possibilities and the options that are available today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Di Prada. I think, um, uh, Moshmi, the one single factor that really makes a difference is providing bursaries and scholarships. I mean, financial aid is the key to giving access, fundamentally. But once they, that's getting into the university, once getting in, of course, the academic support. How do you establish these structures to give them uh, the support they need to be able to navigate? It's even before coming to the university, I would say, if you're trying to attract the first generation, often they do not have the skills to navigate the complexity of the complexities of the application process itself because they've not had any experience of anyone in the family who's been to university. So I think the help begins from at the time they start the application process to um, you know, giving them more support from within. So I, one of the things I really took away my lessons from the Asian University for Women is one of the very clever things the founder did, who was the architect of the constitution for the university, was to actually embed it in the charter that no more than 30% of students will be from Bangladesh. So that kind of, that was a very clever move because it then made 
a lot of space for diverse groups to actually from different countries to actually um, access education on full scholarships and the scholarship scholarships at fifteen thousand um, dollars per year per student and for five years. So we're investing seventy five k thousand um, dollars into each single student. So I think financially it makes a lot of difference and and I think that's one barrier one needs to uh, overcome and then give them the right support to get through their journey during their program of study. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are actually a little over time. I wish we could continue this conversation a little more, but uh, since it's quite late here in India, past 11, uh, five past almost, uh, thank you all, all the esteemed panelists for joining this discussion. And I really hope, sincerely hope, with all the good work that all of you are already doing in your own respective institutions, what we are trying to do here at my own university, we are uh, actually, it's, it's, it's not easy to create inclusive learning spaces. We all know the challenges, but I hope that we all take and look at diversity through the lens of an opportunity and we are able to actually create inclusive learning spaces and promote global citizenship in our respective institutions. Uh, those of you who are audience listening out there, thank you all for joining us. The World University Summit, the three days of online panel discussions. Today is the last uh, 25th panel discussion. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, we have, uh, please join us again. Uh, you will be able to hear Professor Philip Altbach deliver the keynote address uh, from our campus in a hybrid mode. We are going to run the third day of the World University Summit. Uh, so please do join us uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Indian Standard Time uh, to listen to Professor Philip Altbach deliver uh, the keynote address at the Fourth World University Summit. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Bye.